Amen. Hey, good evening, everybody. Go ahead and grab a seat if you haven't yet. Uh, Glad you're here tonight. I I am Mike. I'm the pastor here in case we have not met. Really glad you're here tonight as we continue our series that we've titled What Kids Need. And this is a series, in case you don't know, that is it's for parents and grandparents. It's for aunts and uncles. It's for, for people that have kids in their neighborhoods and people that are around kids anytime. It's a series that's for you because guess what? There are kids that run around this room all the time. And, and, and what we've been discovering is it's kind of God's idea around parenting last week and, and being an adult in kids' lives this week. Now, uh, uh, a couple things you're going to need as we jump in this morning. This morning? <laughs> you know, I told someone uh, earlier, I am so tired tonight. We, uh, we had a, a trip to the hospital in the middle of the night last night with one of our kids. They're fine, but you know what it's like when you just don't sleep? <laughs> and then you got to like, do something like stand in front of people and try to have a thought that makes sense? We'll see how it goes tonight. But you're going to need your Bible tonight. If you don't have one, we've got a couple guys in the back right now that got some Bibles. They would love to drop one in your hands. You can use it for tonight. Or if you don't have one at all, we would love to make that our gift to you. You can take it home with you and uh, keep that if you need one. Or you can use your phone. Speaking of your phone, on your phone, if you use the Version Bible app, on the events page, you can follow tonight's service. And you actually can have all the notes for the sermon in, on your phone right now. You can actually take notes on there and my outlines there if you're interested in following along. And there's a lot of valley happenings there as well. The other thing you're going to need tonight is one of these. I think they're all over the room on your tables and whatnot. And a couple weeks ago we redesigned this. Hopefully you dig it. But uh, one of the things we're doing a little differently is the insides, the guts, that's for you. If you wouldn't mind leaving this either on your table or there's a basket in the back, and what we're going to do is we're just going to reuse this every week during the series, and then when we get to the end of the series, we'll recycle this, and then we'll do a, next, a new one for next series. And so we're kind of, if you're an insider here, we're kind of saving a little bit of money on printing, using the same thing week in, week out, and so it would be wonderful if you wouldn't mind uh, leaving that, unless, like, this is so meaningful to you, and you want to, like, keep it and carry it everywhere you go and hang it on your fridge and your mirror, you're welcome to do that too. That's cool. All right? So let's jump in tonight, grab that Bible, turn to Mark chapter 10, and as you do that, let me, let me ask you, do you remember a time when you were ever, like, like seriously intimidated? Have you ever had a moment where you were, like, like, intimidated, and someone knew they were intimidating you, and someone was trying to intimidate you? Now, I could share a few stories, but the first one that comes to my mind is when I was in seventh grade. Now, I went to junior high, not a middle school, which means it was a school of seventh, eighth, and ninth graders. And so I remember the very first day of seventh grade, and we walked into what was our gym class. In our gym class, the very beginning, what they did is they separated the guys and the gals, and we went into the guys' locker room, and we were going to get our locker, and there was an retired Marine that was the guy that oversaw the the boys' locker room. And this dude was intense. In fact, uh, he had this uh, this paddle. Seriously. This is modern age. He had this paddle in the window to his office, had all these holes drilled into it, and he had all the boys come into the locker room and line up. And this man did not crack a smile at all. And he said, boys, I want you to line up right here. And he walked into his office and he grabbed this paddle. And then he just started walking in front of the line of these seventh grade boys with this paddle just (laughs) hitting it on his leg, not saying a word, walking down the entire line, and then walking all the way back and look at each of us. And then in his just deep and no-nonsense voice, he went on to explain all of the many rules that you had to abide by if you were going to survive <laughs> in that locker room. This, this guy, he, he was an intimidating guy. Now, years later, I got to know him on a personal level. Very different story. But, but that kind of intimidation, do you realize oftentimes when people come into a church service, we might not be walking around with a paddle, but you know what oftentimes they feel is that same level of anxiety and intimidation. They're, they're worried they're going to be judged. 
They're worried they're going to do something wrong. And in doing something wrong, they're worried they're going to be singled out. And they're worried that they're going to, it's going to be acted upon. And you want to know what group of people oftentimes enters into a church service and has that level of anxiety and intimidation. And most of us have no idea that they feel that way and they're worried that way. It's the young. It's the youth. It's the teenagers and and the young children that come in here, even those who are part of our families that walk in here and they're worried. They're worried they're going to do something wrong. They're they're anxious because oftentimes they feel like they're invisible to the big people that have so many important big church things to do that our kids just fly under the radar oftentimes unnoticed, and many times with the perception, perception that they're unwelcomed and unloved. This is, this is the reality of, of many children and many teens in, in churches today. In fact, a little bit later, we're going to talk about a massive study that ended up interviewing and surveying tons of churches across the United States to get a bead on the feel that teens have and young people have when they come into church. And so this series, What Kids Need, last week we began by talking about what kids need, and we said the ki- your affection for God as a parent, grandparent, aunt, uncle, youth worker, or adult in the church, your affection for God is their greatest need. And last week it was really centered mostly on application for the family, although it was application for all of us. Today... Like I mentioned last week, we're we're going to turn our attention to the church, the community of believers when we gather and how, how we, adults, every single one of us, have a role to play in the lives of kids. See, the church represents Jesus here on earth, doesn't it? And, and if the church represents Jesus here on earth, it would be wise, no, 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 it would be vital for us to know how Jesus thinks about young people. It would be really important for us to make sure we're interacting with young people the way Jesus does, right? So to do that, let's look at an encounter Jesus had where there were actually barriers to young people coming to be in the presence and interacting with Jesus And there's a lot we can learn from this passage. Look with me. Mark chapter 10. Just a few short verses today. Kind of the opposite of last week where we did a ton of verses, right? Verses 13 through 16. Listen here. The passage reads. It says, And they, likely parents, adults, were bringing children to him, Jesus, that he might touch them. They were bringing young people to Jesus that he would lay his hands upon them. And the disciples, Jesus' 12 and beyond that, the, the ones that were closest to him and followed him, they rebuked them. They rebuked, they chastised, they pushed away the people that would bring young people into the presence of Jesus. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. And he said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms, and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. Now tonight, there is... a a few handful of principles that I would ask you to consider. That I would ask you to consider as an adult in this room. And if you're a a teen in this room, here's what I would ask you to do. I'd ask you to just be praying for the adults around you, which might sound like a weird thing to do. Because oftentimes we talk about adults praying for teens, but if you're a teen in this room, your job tonight, be praying that God would, would capture the attention of the adults in this room so that we would carry the perspective Jesus has toward young people. Why? So that we can represent them? And so that we, we can stop and close the back door of, of 20-somethings exiting out never to follow Jesus anymore. 
So let, let's look at a few of these principles. The first one that just sits at the very top of the passage. It should be as clear as day. Jesus challenges those who are not welcoming to children. Jesus, he challenges those who are not welcoming to children. He confronts them. He even corrects them. Listen again, verse 13. And when they were bringing children to him, that he might touch them, the disciples re rebuke them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. And he said to them, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. Now, ancient Jewish culture did not view children the way most of us do today. Ancient Jewish culture did not have the same kind of affection for young people that often you see at least stereotyped in, in the modern family world. Most children didn't have much value unless they were intimately connected to a male who was wealthy. It was kind of the same, honestly, with women in that age. It was so overly domineering, patriarchal, that, that women and children oftentimes were pushed aside. You see Jesus constantly challenging this, right? Jesus constantly recognizing the value and the worth, not just of children, of women, of men, of all people. But that's the way ancient cult, Jewish culture was. Kids were, were small. They had small worth. And so the disciples... They felt like the kids had small worth and the disciples felt like they had high worth. Kids weren't just uh, small of worth, they were small of importance, but the disciples, they viewed themselves as having high importance. I mean, these were the guys that were following Jesus. These were the guys that wanted to be covered in the dust of their rabbi. These were the guys that were learning the teaching of Jesus and following him city after city, town after town, long nights, long days, sleeping in the wilderness. These were the guys that in their mind, they deserved to be close to Jesus. Who are these parents bringing these snot-nosed children to take our place next to rabbi? No, 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 no. Get these kids out of here. This is my spot. That was their perspective. That's how the, the disciples were likely thinking. That's how they were likely processing this situation. And Jesus says he was indignant. This is actually the, one, of the, one of the only times this word is used of Jesus. This being indignant is this idea that he was, he was angered because of injustice. What, what, what kind of injustice angers you? What makes you indignant? See, what makes you indignant tells a lot about who you are. Later in Mark, the disciples get indignant because two of the disciples asked Jesus for prominent places and positions and authority. And they're like, ooh, I wanted that. And so the disciples become indignant because they're not getting their way. But you know what makes Jesus indignant? You know what fuels anger because of injustice in Jesus? Is when someone would put a barrier between a child and him. When someone would act in a way that would, would cause space and a gap in in build a wall between young people coming to him. That's what makes Jesus indignant. That's why, that's why he steps in. He's roused to anger. Which, if we're supposed to mirror Jesus, if we're supposed to follow in his footsteps, if the church is meant to be the representation of Jesus here on earth, that means if we are not, if I am not welcoming toward kids, guess what? I am standing against Jesus. If you're not welcoming toward kids, you're standing against Jesus. How important are the youth and the kids that are part of this church to you tonight? I have, I have a friend last night, he was visiting, they stayed at our house, and uh, he, he was telling me that he has, he has no interest in the Seahawks whatsoever. <laughs> he, he lives in Federal Way, he's a dear friend, uh, he and his wife, and, and he says, I cannot name you one player on the Seahawks. It, it kind of shocked me, right? The, the culture we live in, the world we live in, it's like, you can't name, you, you don't know who Russell Wilson, he doesn't know who Russell Wilson is. <laughs> he doesn't know the name of one Seahawks player. How many teenagers that are here tonight do you know their name is of? How many 
kids in the back, can you greet by name? We, we, we know the names of every Seahawk because we value them, because we love them, because they're important to us. We know the names of every child and every teen because we know them, we value them because they're important to us. See, if, if we don't know those things, there's a chance that probably not intentionally, but still, you are you're part of creating barriers in the church to make the church a place where young people thrive. This, is just, this might be a gut check, and if it is, man, I'm thankful you're here because I think it, you'll grow because of it. But, but guess what? If, if we don't know their kids' names, they're not going to feel welcome. And they're not going to feel like this is their church. And when they get old enough to not have mom and dad drag them here, guess what? They're not going to want to come. But think about it the other way. What if almost all of us know the names of almost every kid and teenager here? And we're giving them a high five and calling by name and asking them about their sports game this week and asking them about their tests in school and asking them how things are going with this project or this. We know just enough about them to show interest. You know what that's going to do to kids? They're going to start saying, this isn't my parents' church. This is my church. These aren't my parents' friends. These are my friends. See, most of us, I don't think, subscribe to the idea that kids should be seen and not heard, right? I'd be surprised if some of us felt that way. Most of us wouldn't say that kids should be probably not even seen. They should just be tucked back in there. And this is about big people having big people church. But here's the deal. There's a difference between passive and active pursuit. Right? And this is a call to recognize Jesus, he cares for them. See, Jesus challenges those who are not welcoming to children. Tonight, I think Jesus is challenging us as a church to make sure we are not unintentionally falling into the camp where we're not welcoming the children. Now, here's the deal. Afterward, don't gang up on the kids. <laughs> right? They come out of there and we're all just waiting. <laughs> but, beware. And be intentional. Look for those opportunities. This could be one of the places where the tide turns for the next generation here in this church or here in Longview. Who knows what kind of impact it can have. See, he challenges people not welcoming. Why? Because Jesus honors childlike faith. Look with me again, verse 14. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant, and he said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. He says, he says this, for, for these, to these belong the kingdom of God. Hey, let, me, let me ask you another question. Do you possess the kingdom of God? Have you laid your hands upon the kingdom of heaven? Does it belong to you? Do you belong to it? Because Jesus, he reveals what it looks like to know that you, you belong to it and it belongs to you. He honors childlikeness. But what is it that he's honoring in this moment? Well, it, it's not immaturity that he has in view. He, he's not talking about being childlike, being immature. The Bible speaks to this. Paul writes, he says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. He's not talking about being childlike because you're collecting my little pony still. He's not talking about being childlike because you're not maturing in your ways of thinking and you're not maturing in your ability to, to pursue uh, adulthood. He's not talking about being childlike. He's actually not even talking about innocence. That's oftentimes how this passage is interpreted. To be childlike, to be innocent. But, but guess what? He, when he talks about these children, the Greek word actually refers to an infant likely. It says he takes them in his arms. I don't think he was picking up a 15-year-old. <laughs> Right? Or a 10-year-old. Braxton, come here. Let me pick you up for a second, right? 
He, he's, he's talking about likely someone so young that they had yet to reach what is typically called the, to, to be the age of accountability. Now, he's not saying that the child doesn't have sin. He's talking about age of accountability and, it's, and it's, its ability to be accountable for it. But guess what? Every one of us knows children are born selfish. Feed me, change me, hold me, care for me. Right? It, 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 all the way through teen years, all those things that still, teenagers still say, except for the hold me thing, right? Like, feed me, change my socks, or clean my laundry, or, you know, don't hold me, don't touch me, but... Kids are, they're sinful. They inherited it the same way every one of us did. Theologically, it's called imputed sin. We could talk about that another day. So he's not talking about innocence. He's not talking about being immature. In fact, it, 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 it's not their virtue in and of itself. It's probably the fact that they are helpless that he has in view here. Saying, you, to such as these, to those who are helpless, to those who realize their need, belong the kingdom of God. See, Jesus is calling us to a childlike faith. A childlike faith is a faith that recognizes our helplessness. See, Jesus is calling us tonight to trust him. He's calling us to trust. When, when he says, you, you, the, to these belong the kingdom of God, he's talking about trust. See, a child trusts their parents implicitly. They trust them for their every need. Here, the idea is, do you trust Jesus implicitly? Do you trust him completely? Yes, to provide Yes, to care. Yes, to comfort. But, but really, the target here, the idea here, is you trust him completely for your salvation. The, the, the picture here of, of being called to receive the kingdom of God like a child means that you come to God, you come to Jesus, and you trust him, meaning that you re realize that you bring nothing to the table whatsoever. It's, it's the gospel. It's saying, I am, I am helpless in my sin. I have rebelled against God. I have turned my back on him. I am wretched. I am depraved. And there is nothing I can do about it. I cannot fix me. There is nothing I bring to the table. I need to trust Jesus completely to be my savior through, listen carefully, his death on a cross and his resurrection from the grave. See, see, to enter into the kingdom with childlike faith is to enter in believing that, that you are completely helpless to save yourself. And he is completely sufficient as your savior. You're being called to trust him tonight. Have you done that yet? This might be the moment for you where, where it comes into, into clarity because here's what I find. People can come to church their whole life and never actually make this moment where they decide to trust Jesus. They can do the church thing. They can, they can serve. They can do all the right things, say all the right things, be part of all of the events and never step over that line and say, never say, I can't earn it. I don't bring anything in and of myself. I am lost and sinful. I fall upon the Savior. If you have not done that tonight, it might be your night. Trust him. Don't, don't let me twist your arm into it. No, no, you and him, not you, me and him, you and him, trust him as a savior. But you're, you're not just being called to trust him, you're, you're being called to depend on him. I love this picture throughout Mark of people who are desperate to touch and be near Jesus Go, go home this week and, and just read through Mark. It's a pretty short gospel. Just read through it and look for how desperate people are to touch him, to depend on him, to say, Jesus, I need you. Not just for my salvation. I, I need you for the very breath that I breathe. I need your purpose in my life. I need your comfort in my life. I need your hope in my life. I need your presence in my life. I need your joy in my life. I need your grace in my life. I need your mercy in my life. You're, you're being called to depend on him. 
See, it's one thing to trust him for our salvation, but to, to fully understand that it, it, it moves you to this lifestyle, not of, oh, I'm so mature, I've graduated, I no longer need Jesus. No, no, no. Maturity is actually, I need you more. I want you more. I depend on you more. See, Jesus, he, he honors this childlike faith. He, he challenges those who, who aren't welcoming to the young. He honors this childlike faith. And then the third observation is, is finally, Jesus blesses children who come to him. Verse 16, he says, And he took them in his arms, and he blessed them, laying his hands on them. You know, we, we don't have a lot of details, but what this probably looked like is he probably took one child and held it close, lay his hand upon it, and, and likely the blessing was him praying for it. Heavenly Father, be with this child. Heavenly Father, lead this child in the path of righteousness. Heavenly Fa Father, help this child to come to a place where they know me for who I am, where they trust me and they depend on me. This is your pattern for praying for your children every night, by the way. Yeah, seriously, whether they're asleep or not, whether they're 100 miles or not, this is the exact pr prayer of blessing and of faith and of righteousness. And then he, then he probably handed it back to the parent, and then he probably took the next child and did the exact same kind of thing, one after another. Who knows how many was there? He, he slowed down, and he cared for these children. He cared for them. He stood as an adult, not as their parent, acting in the best interest of the young people that were around him. This is what I believe the posture the church today needs to take. That we stand as an adult. Many of us aren't parents of, of the kids that run around here. Some of us are. But as adults, we stand here and, and we, we look out for the best interest. We bless the children that are around us what would it look like if we took that posture? What would it look like if churches across America had that posture? I think it would be incredible. Specifically, what does it look like today? What do kids and youth actually need in the church environment? Do the kids, when they come out here, do they need us to pick them up in our arms and pray for them like that? Probably not. If you're a stranger to them, they definitely don't need that. Although it would be kind of funny to watch. What, what do they need? Well, a few years ago, there was an organization at Fuller uh, Youth Center. They did a, a study across America, and they actually they, they identified the 250 churches that seemed to be most effective in reaching the next generation. And, the, and they, they went and they had exhaustive interviews with the young people. And you know what they found was, was drawing these kids to be part of uh, the community? It actually was not the lights or the worship. I mean, those things can be helpful and all that stuff. It actually wasn't that. They landed on six core practices that churches that make the biggest difference in the lives of young people regularly, they saw these core practices across the board at these 250 churches. Bottom line, here's what kids need. Kids need, they need real adult relationships. That's what these six core practices ends up pointing to. Let me, let me explain these six core practices. First of all, they see life through kids' eyes, through the eyes of young people. Instead of being adults that criticize and that judge young people, that judge their clothing, that judge their attitude, that judge their language and their slang, that judge their immaturity, forgetting that we used to be immature also and we had all sorts of things that we used to do that were really strange to the previous generation. Instead of doing that, the adults, what they do is they, they look at life through the eyes of young people. What would happen if you gave that a shot? Just to observe and think through, what, what are young people experiencing today? What are young people experiencing when they walk in the doors of, of this church? The second thing is they center everything on Jesus. They, they kind of strip back a lot of the, the extra things. It's not that they don't do those extra things, but, but the idea is everything comes back to Jesus. 
Everything comes back to the, the Savior who died for them and rose again. Everything comes back to Jesus' compassion and grace and mercy. Everything comes back to the reality of God paying the price for our sins. as our Everything comes back to the gospel. They center everything on Jesus. This is so helpful. What if every one of us started centering everything on Jesus, not on church tradition, not on our preference, what if we let go of our preference to make room for young people and just made sure we centered everything on Jesus? That's what these churches that are doing uh, the most beneficial work with young people are doing. Third, they, they fuel warm community. Literally, instead of focusing on cool worship or programs, they aim for warm relationships that are intergenerational. This is exactly what I'm talking about by knowing the names of young people in our church. We, we, there's a family at the Heights service that they adopted our kids as, the, as their honorary grandkids. Right? And they, and they act like grandparents. It, it, I'm just telling you guys, as a dad, I, I am so overwhelmed and blessed every time I see this couple interact with my kids. Because what is happening in this moment is my kids are having an incredibly warm and positive interaction with mature believers that aren't mom and dad. And down the road, I, I can guarantee what's going to happen. My kids are going to have a, a situation where they're going to be tired of hearing what mom and dad say, and they're going to end up sitting down with this couple or someone like them, and this couple's probably going to say the exact same thing that I would say. But because it's not me saying it, you know what's going to happen? My kids are going to listen. Because they're going to have this warm, caring relationship. See, a church that fuels warm relationships and warm community is a church that gets it. They, they share leadership is the next one. This is the idea that instead of holding on to our ministry, holding on to control of what we want things to look like, we are intentionally giving away not just responsibility, but listen very carefully, authority to young people. There's a young guy that's been doing, learning the soundboard. He's not even in high school yet. I love seeing that. Because you know what's happening? This kid has authority to ruin the service. <laughs> <laughs> he owns it. He owns it. What does it look like to give authority? Like, like the right level... Right? You don't just give them the whole thing, right? You don't give a 15-year-old your keys and say, hey, it's all yours, go knock yourself out. No, no, the right level at the right time, but it's intentionally sharing with that next generation. <clears throat> Fifth thing is they prioritize young people and families everywhere. Instead of giving lip service to wanting to be a younger church, they actually prioritize it. They prioritize it in the way they organize their services. They prioritize it in the way they spend their money. They prioritize it in, in what they choose as higher values as they make decisions about what their church does. How is this going to affect young people? How is this going to affect families? And you know what? Some of us don't like hearing that. Because some of us aren't young people and some of us don't have kids. And so we say, oh, well, this will maybe mean that what I want isn't going to be the forefront of everything. Sounds a lot like spiritual maturity in that moment for us, doesn't it? To say, yeah, let's focus on the next generation. It's not about us. That's what the churches that at least are succeeding to reach the next generation are doing. And, and finally, it says that be great neighbors. Be great neighbors. This is the idea that if instead of condemning the world outside of the church walls, they enable young people to neighbor well locally. This is, this is why we did that whole five weeks of pray for every home. Some of you are still praying. I'm still praying. Are you still praying for your neighbors? If you haven't signed up yet, you still can't pray for every home. What it does, you just pray for your neighbors every day, five of them. It doesn't take very long. But in praying for your neighbors, it moves your heart to love your neighbors. So instead of being a jerk to your neighbor, instead of being mad at your neighbor, you care about their soul. And you end up serving your neighbor and loving your neighbor. You become a great neighbor. You know what? Kids see that and they say, wow, this church is actually acting like Jesus instead of just judging people. I want to stick around. I want to stick around. See, this is what it looks like for us to, to bless the next generation. We, we stand with Jesus when we stand for kids. Right? Can I get an amen? amen. So let me, let me do this. Let me invite Andrew. Andrew is our youth, or children's director. He's the associate pastor leading children's ministry. And Vinny, can you come on up too? 
Vinny is our youth director. And these are two guys that are kind of, they lead the charge in reaching some of the next generation and caring for the next generation. And so what I wanted to do, we actually didn't plan it out super well, but I just want to invite them. You guys want to grab a mic? You can share it or, or whatnot. Uh, I, I want them to both just take a minute and invite us as a church to start caring for the next generation. In fact, if you open up your program, there's a little document that both of them have. One, of them, one side says caring for teens. The other side says caring for kids. That might be helpful to have in your hands right now. But it looks like Vinny's first. These guys. You see what I got to You see what I got to deal with? Come on up here. Vinny, what would you what would you want to share with the church about how we can continue to do some of these things you just heard, but but care for teenagers at Valley and in Cowles County? Well, kind of like what I wrote in the, in the list in your uh, program is uh, just bring a bunch of candy. They like candy. They like, they like food, too. No, uh, seriously, a lot of what uh, Pastor Mike is talking about is just treating them like they have something of value, value to give. Um, introducing yourself, uh, respecting them. That was actually, I, I, I talked to the kids the other day, and I asked them these questions. You know, what, what do you guys want from adults? And the biggest thing was... We just want to be greeted, respected, uh, 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 introduced, uh, you know, a handshake, a smile, um, treated like we have something valuable to give. That's probably the biggest thing. Cool. If we could be praying one thing for teenagers today, what would it be? That they could just grow in their hunger for the Lord. Um, and our, our, youth, our youth ministry here right now, uh, we're experiencing that they're just so hungry to know more about God, just who he is, how he created the world, how he loves us, how he saved us. If you could just be praying that they would just grow in that hunger. If, if someone wanted to be part of youth ministry, could they? Absolutely. We need help. Do you, you, you already have enough leaders? You, you don't we, need any more? No, we need more help. Uh, we're growing, guys. We, I think a few months ago, we were under 20. We're almost to 30. In fact, I think we're at 30 students right now in our youth ministry. So my, uh, hope, my hope is that we can have one adult leader per five students, and uh, we're not hitting that right now. Um, we could use more people to come alongside us. Uh, my, my next phase that I want to get into is having small groups on different nights of the week, and we need small group leaders. We need people to be able to lead uh, boys groups. We need people to lead uh, young girls groups. Um, each Wednesday, uh, we, th as we unpack the Bible, they have more and more and more questions about the Bible and about God. And if we could have some more of these small groups throughout the week, that would be a great environment for them to be able to um, have some of those questions answered and to grow in their knowledge of the Lord. So grab Vinny afterward if you have yeah. any desire to, to connect with us. Andrew, why don't you grab the mic? <coughs> so, so same thing, like, just... From your perspective, what does it look like for us to serve children well? Okay. So from my perspective, uh, there are a couple of different angles in which we can be welcoming children within our church. Actually, in your bulletin, we were asked to put together a formal and an informal way. Uh, formally, right now, as a children's ministry, we just had our first parent and volunteer meeting this morning, and we're actually moving from being a children's ministry to a family-based ministry because we know that it's not, it's not, we're not to leave the discipleship and to the loving and care of spiritual development of our children up to religious professionals. It's actually, the Bible says that's, it's, it's families, it's parents that are supposed to be doing that. So, but along with that, we also know now as, as a um, millennial, um, I, I've been talking to more and more people who, who have children and it's interesting, we are admitting that there are gaps in our knowledge. There are a lot of people who are saying like, you know what? I want to be able to raise my child and raise my kids. I want, to, I want to be able to lead my family in devotions and things like that. I know we should be doing that, but I don't know what that looks like. My family didn't do that growing up. I don't, should I just be reading the Bible verbatim for them? Should I be, how should I break that down? So we are starting to create resources and opportunities to show families how to walk with their own families. So one thing you can do is to be praying for families. The other thing with that is also is to, is to continue to grow in your own love for the Lord as well and ask questions. It's when we realize, or we don't know what we don't know. And so when you think you have it figured out that you're fine, you're probably doing your child a disservice. It's, it's what's happening. 
So formally, you can start learning that way. Formally, if you're ready to, you can step up and step into family, uh, youth, children and family ministry. There are plenty of opportunities. Right now, I'm, I'm back there with some kids. Mallory, who is usually back there with me, she's, she's been gone for the last uh, month or so working on her house. But across all the other campuses, there is a need for people who have a burden to walk with children to be in their lives. If, you don't, if, you're, if it freaks you out to, to work with children, join the club. <laughs> Number two, though, if it freaks you out, that's good. There are actually training opportunities. There are opportunities for us to learn and grow together as we, as we serve that. But also, you don't have to work directly with kids. There are people who help prep crafts, prep um, the curriculum. They prep the, uh, the snacks and everything like that, or even just checking kids in. Just if, you, if you just want to be behind a computer and work with kids, I can, get, I can set you up with that. But let's, let's actually step into the informal, right? Because I think that actually matters a lot more. Uh, I'll, I'll share a quick story. How, how much? You said I had 20 minutes, right? <laughs> when, I, when I was a youth pastor uh, years ago, when I was a young man, um, I, had, I had a student come into the church for the first time ever. He had been coming to our Friday night outreaches, and he, he came uh, to our Wednesday nights and finally decided, you know what, I want to come and check out what Sunday is like. And he came in, and he, this is back when, like, skateboarding was huge, and he had, like, baggy sh shorts and everything, just, like, 90s kids, man. I loved it. But he also had a trucker hat, and he came into the service, and there was a deacon, well, I'm not say who, I'm sorry, I shouldn't even say deacon, but <laughs> there was a leader, redacted, in our church that <laughs> saw this, that saw this gentleman, and he started walking over, and I was super excited. I was like, oh, man, here we go. We're going to, here's someone who's going to welcome this young man into our yeah. church and the deacon, sorry, the leader, redacted, <laughs> looked at this young man and said, you need to take your hat off. This is the Lord's house, and how dare you wear a, ha a hat in the Lord's sanctuary. This was the first thing that was said to this child. So one of the things I wrote on, on the form is, um, it's not our job to discipline people. You shouldn't, if you want to welcome children, don't see yourself as someone who's going to teach them the right things and you're going to discipline them. Redirect them. There are opportunities for children to get into trouble all across this building, right? You, 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 they're people. My kids are finding a lot of those. <laughs> right? Sometimes I'll watch kids, like, come over to our snack table and, like, double fist a, a sandwich or something. You know, and that's fun. That's exciting. That's fun. There's plenty of food, but you don't need to. We're, we're here to welcome. So just take that energy and just redirect them into, like, hey, that's awesome that you're getting fed. Are you ready to get checked into children's ministry? That's a lot more involved, like, welcoming than slapping some kid's hand. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> the other thing too, just kind of like Vinny said, that these are people, when working with children, it's, it's more than fine to get on their level, literally to get on your yeah. knee yeah, yeah. and look at them and have eye contact. Children have a lot of ridiculous stories they want to share, but that's what they want to share. And if we're going to be a welcoming church, let them share what they have to say. It, it's, it's hilarious, right? But be engaged, get down on their level, and let them know that they are loved. It could be the weirdest or most inappropriate thing ever, but what you're communicating to them is that they are valued and that they are loved. And that, at the end of the day, that's what matters most. That's great. There was a lot of irony in those last few sentences. Is it because I'm taller than Vinny? Oh, I, try, I try to. I just, hey, buddy. I was, I was just waiting for someone to say, unless you're Vinny, you don't really have to get on your knees to get to their eye level. I was waiting for that joke. We all thought. I, I know. No, I don't, I don't want you to touch the mic anymore, either of you. You, you never know what you're going to get. You know, one of Andrew's, what he said is, you know, children have a lot of ridiculous things they want to share. And Andrew's saying that it was the irony there. Like, here we go. I'm giving him a mic. Lord, be merciful. Really, though, thank you guys. That's exactly what I wanted us to hear. Because you, you get... This is a heart. This is a posture of heart. This is the heart the Lord has for the young that we, as his representatives here on earth, are called to. And this is a beautiful thing if we all catch this vision. And if this becomes a place where kids can't wait to come in here. Not because of the snacks that are great. Not because of the preaching that is incredible. No. <laughs> the worship, right? No, no. They come because they can't wait for the way the adults treat them. Right? All right. So let me, let me close by asking you to, to consider 
Where do you find yourself in the story that we heard from the Scripture tonight? Do you find yourself aligned with the parents that are just desperately trying to get your kids into the presence of Christ? I relate to that. Do you find yourself having a similar posture to the disciples who are more concerned with the adult ministry and the adult cares and the adult issues of of their day than they are concerned about the next generation? I I can relate to that at moments too. And if that's you, this is a call to to repentance. To to literally change the way you think. Let the Lord's word transform our minds. Hopefully you find yourself growing in the perspective of Jesus who says, let the children come to me. And then he blessed them. Heavenly Father, thank you, for, thank you for this night. Thank you for this great picture we have in the scripture of, of how Jesus cares deeply for the next generation. And God, I pray that Valley would would become a church that has the the same heart and the same posture, that we would be burdened to love the next generation, that this would be the warmest and most welcoming and caring experience that kids have week in and week out. Lord, we recognize they go to schools that are hard, They interact in a culture that is so selfish and so confusing. Lord, what a refuge we can be to them as they come and they find love and guidance and truth as they come and they find Jesus. So that's our request tonight. That's our prayer. That's our desire, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. I really do pray that, that as a church, we can grasp onto this vision. And, and tonight, we're going to close with one more song. But before we do that, I want to invite you to respond. Respond by taking your connection card right out of your program. I know you've already grabbed it once tonight. And there's a, there, on the back, there's, there's really one big commitment there. Now, you can, you can connect with a life group. You can RSVP for the potluck that's going to happen next weekend. But the first one, it says, I am committing to seeing life through the eyes of young. I just, I'm just going to ask you to make that commitment tonight. To see life through the eyes of the young. And then in just a minute after I pray, the, the ushers will come through and they'll have the, the bins. And you can drop your connection card in there. You can actually drop your offering in there as well. Let's commit to this together. And then we'll sing one more song and, and, and we'll go on with our evening. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, again, we, we thank you for this evening, for the goodness of your word. God, I thank you for everyone here tonight that's willing to make that commitment to say, I'm, I'm going to commit to seeing life through the eyes of young people. God, I pray that as we do that, you would give us empathy for them. You would give us a sensitivity and awareness. You would give us wisdom in how to interact with them. These next few weeks as we talk about grace and truth, you would allow us to balance those two postures perfectly. God, I pray it's for the great benefit of the next generation and that it's for your glory because you're God. God, also I thank you for those who are here and and who, who worship by giving in the offering. God, I pray you bless them. I pray you bless this offering, that you would use it for your purposes. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.